Okay, let's get started again. I am I uh, had a good question during the break, which is sort of like, how do you know your architecture is any good? And the correlated question is, is how do you become a good architect? Uh, and it's something I've actually thought about a fair amount. The, 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 a, a, a good first order answer, how you know your architecture is any good, is what happens when you try to add an unexpected. How well does it accommodate? Uh, does it break stuff? Uh, do you suddenly run across decisions that were self-limiting? Now, in some cases, as, as, a, as the story I think I've already told them here about rotating headlines and stages, where the CEO said, can we make our headlines rotate? They said, Larry, this was never designed. Never designed to have rotating headlines. It's an entirely different type of word processor. Uh, he bugged me about that a few times. I finally gave up. Uh, but on the other hand, when we went to do something completely unexpected, which was web page editing, it worked wonderfully and we got it all implemented, something we literally had never considered because it didn't exist when we developed the product. We were able to implement it in a uh, 450,000 line code base of a you know, desktop publishing system in about three months. It fell naturally out of the architecture. Now, the bigger question, and I would, I would love to teach a class on software architecture, because this is actually one of the hard problems in software engineering. How do you get to be a good architect? I would say there's, there's basically two factors. First, you have to look at a lot of good and not so good code, and see what works and what doesn't work. In other words, it's useful to, and, and, one of the books that I used to use in this class, uh, I've already replaced it for now, but it's a great uh, extra credit reading for one, Facts and Fallacy of Software Engineering. Robert Glass complains, he thinks we should teach soft, we should teach programming by having people read code, read really good code. It's, it's what you do in English class, English composition. You go and read some really, really good authors, and then they say, you know, write a paragraph like this author. Write a short story, in, you know, style of Hemingway. Uh, we don't have you read really good code. And I can tell you, reading really good code is a delight. I've, I've had aha moments looking at code that's come from elsewhere, and it's like, oh my gosh, that is so well done. I mean, with, within programming, the, the highest compliment you give to someone's code is it's elegant. Which means it does what it's supposed to do, it's clean, it's understandable, and it's minimal. Accomplishments task. Yeah, and that's assuming you already kind of speak. Right? I'm sorry, when you, you, know, you can read the language, but that's assuming you already know words. Oh, well, yes, there is that too. But, uh, you know, if, if I were, frankly, if I were teaching beginning programming, I would start with good code samples and say, let's analyze this, figure out what's going on line by line. Uh, instead of, you know, here's a Java manual. Go right below world. Uh, the other thing, and this this is sort of all I all I can speak to is my own experience. I think what helped me develop my architectural skills was that I did two projects with extreme constraints. The first is when I talked about at uh, Monitor Labs, where we're doing the new data acquisition devices. These were embedded systems, 6502 processor, very limited RAM, most of the software wrong. This is one where I was, was sitting with my feet up on the desk for three weeks. And what I did for three weeks was I, I thought about all the things we needed to do and I thought about all the limitations within the system. The other, I think, was Sundog for the Apple II. Because we were building a much bigger game that could really literally fit on an Apple II. The uh, Apple II discs held 140K and we literally, and they had this little notch on it so that it would recognize it as a disc so you could put the disc in upside down. You literally punched a notch on the other side so you could use both sides of the disc. So to play the game, you'd boot up on one side, you'd load your player, then you'd pull the disc out and stick it back in and the operating system wouldn't know that you just flipped the disc. That gave us a whole other disc of storage. Uh, 
But I, I do that memory map. 64K, actually 48K for the longest time. I kept going back to Wayne and saying, Wayne, this isn't going to fit 48K. And finally, not long before the one over release, he said, okay, okay, we can require that they upgrade to 64K, which is like a $20 card that you had to buy and plug in. That's 16K of memory, $40 card that you buy and plug in. Not that big. Uh, and, <clears throat> but, I had to make a very complex game work in very tight space, and I became keenly aware every time I tried to add something here, it would take away something here. Uh, I wrote the graphics library entirely from scratch. The Apple had a really funky graphics hardware. Thank you, Steve Wozniak. Uh, the, uh, and actually, my original graphics library was far more complex. It had overlapping windows, it had icons, it had menus, and so on. It was far more complex, and I had to keep throwing chunks of it out because we needed the space for, for actual game code. Uh, those, I think those experiences were a great preparation for me when I got to pages because I was used to thinking ahead as to everything that was going to have to be done. And I was used to working in constrained environments. Now, Pages wasn't a constrained environment by any of today's terms, but, uh, or by, by then terms, it is by today's terms. 16 megabytes of RAM, that the next computer had. Uh, but, you know, having come not that many years before, from, well, 10 years before from an Apple II where it was, you know, 64K, 16 megabytes of RAM. Yes, the Great Plains. I have space as far as the eye can see. I have this display postscript imaging model. I don't have to do any graphics. And I can focus on the, uh, uh, the architecture itself. Uh, I, would, I would like to teach a class because I would like to figure out how to teach architecture. I'd like to figure out what kind of exercises and what kind of assignments help you develop your skills in software architecture? I couldn't tell you exactly what they are right now. I would have to do some serious research and thinking. Uh, anyway, so it was a great question. So let me do my pre-editing here. Peopleware, part three. If you remember nothing else from this class, and I sure will remember a lot from this class. <laughs> remember this slide. That's success in software development. Find the right people, learn to hold on to them, set them loose to do their best work. Empower them to use them over work. This is how the best software gets written. This is how successful startups succeed. All of these tasks are hard. The right people doesn't even necessarily mean the most talented. It means people who can get along and work with each other. Uh, as I've said before, at Pages, the development team almost flew apart. Thanks to Rick Gessner, uh, we managed to sort of cobble things back together and uh, actually learned to, to deeply respect each other and work together. But Making them happy so they don't want to leave. Jet C effect. You guys ever read that? Uh, yeah. It's a very real phenomenon. Uh, and I see it happen all the time. I have friends who are placed and said, yeah, this was great when we started, but you know, now I'm looking around for another job. Things just are not. Things aren't happy here anymore. And turn them loose. This is these these are all factors that they're going to talk about a lot in the book. Okay, getting the right people. Uh, I will say that in the last 20 years there has been an increased appreciation for the sort of differences of high high performing software engineers 
but you will still find situations where uh, corporate situations where you're a programmer and you're supposed to be there from 8 to 5 and have nice slacks and a nice dress shirt on and, and even shoes. Uh, I'm well known for going first. Uh, I'll tell a few of those stories. Anyway, uh, unprofessional. Now, I talk about professionalism, but for me, professionalism is showing up, doing the work, emotional maturity. Uh, not sabotaging others. For other organizations, professional is, you know, I don't like those pants she's wearing. I don't like his t-shirt. His hair is a bit too long. Why does she have that nose ring? And they tend to be more concerned about stuff like that than, oh, by the way, she cranks out, you know, a thousand lines of solid code a week. Uh, uniformity is always increasing in the organization again. And, and when, when we talk about, when we go through the book uh, Accelerate, we'll see the different management styles and how high performing organizations differ from low performing organizations. But what you need in all of this is leadership. And you need you need to learn how to lead technical people. It's not easy. For one thing, you all tend to be very smart. For another thing, or for whatever it's worth, software engineers tend to be have strong opinions. <laughs> uh, and it's easy for us to be disdainful of someone that we don't think is as well informed or even as smart as us. And so there's a real need for leadership in IT purposes. Carol Teasley and Fannie Mae were, did work for her for two years. Uh, if she called me up tomorrow and said, hey Bruce, Got this new project going on. Want to join up? I'd probably say, yeah. She's one of the finest leaders I've ever known. Uh, she treated the people who worked for her. She was very demanding, but she was also fiercely protective of the people that she that who worked for her. And that's a what that's a powerful combination. When someone's trying to demand the best of you, and they at the same time are protecting your interests, you build a lot of loyalty towards that person. So, leadership is not a work extraction mechanism. <laughs> it's a form of service. It involves innovation, which often involves rebellion. Uh, in other words, leadership is running interference and going to bat for your people. It's not trying to fit them into a particular mold. It's giving them what they need to do their best professionally. As I'm fond of saying, loyalty is a two-way street. You'll hear organizations, well, why aren't they more loyal to us? Like, yeah, what have you done to earn that loyalty? I worked for organizations that I thought were wonderful. I worked for organizations that was kind of like, yeah, man. Uh, and I worked for organizations where after a few months it's like, I gotta get out of here. I can't stand this anymore. I was actually the case working on. I mean, I, I followed the space program since eighty eight, okay, nineteen sixty one. Kennedy, we're going to send a man to the moon by the end of the decade. I followed the space program closely. Second job out of college, my dream job, working on the Space Shuttle Flight Simulator, Johnson Space Center, NASA. Mingling with astronauts. Going by a Saturn V, sitting on the, its side at the entrance to JSC every day going to work. I quit after six months. One of the reasons is that management 
was so poor and so hostile. It's just kind of like, this isn't worth it. Went next door to the Lunar Planetary Institute. And actually had a very cozy job that if I were smart, I'd probably still be working at today. But after two years in Houston, I was from San Diego. It's like, nah, I'm going back to San Diego. I still sort of think, well, oh, was that really a wise move? Because it was a great job. Those of you who have been working out there, what, what experiences have you had pros and cons in terms of leadership or lack thereof that you've seen in your organizations? Anyone? Yes? I was working at the IT building. The, I had a manager, a supervisor, who well, he micromanaged us. And that drove me out so fast. And I went over to the new place that I was at. One of the first things they said to me when I, on my first day was, we're not going to micromanage you. Do your stuff, and we'll be nice to you. And I was like, I'm staying here forever. What was your productivity differences between the two places? Well, I don't know if I can give a number to that, but I think it's a difference between wanting to work for them and not wanting to work for them. Yeah. Well, that, and that's, that's probably as, as good a description as any. <laughs> uh, if you're unhappy, it's hard to do great work. Anyone else? Anyone else? Experiences. Don't want to go on camera talking about your bosses. So. <laughs> I understand. Okay. Hiring approaches. Oh, God. You know, this whole fad started about 15, 20 years ago. We're going to give you some brain customers. <coughs> Hire you based on whether or not you happen to come up with the answer that we think you should have. Uh, I think that's an absolutely asinine approach, Hiring. I really do. It seems to be dying off. I, I know it still exists. Uh, their chapter is, you know, if you're a hired juggle, juggler, you don't ask him what he thinks about, you know, economics in Chicago. You ask him to joke. Uh, now, I like the idea of portfolio work done to date. Now, there's a problem with that. <laughs> Most companies won't let you walk out with your source code. And when I get to my lecture on legal risks, you don't want to walk out of your source code. I have, I have been an expert witness in multi-million dollar lawsuits that involve people walking out of their source code when they should not have. Uh, the, you know, do a linked list in Java stuff. I'm not sure I do that and say, tell me, tell me the pros and cons of the linked list when you might want to use it. I have probably programmed professionally in, I want to say somewhere between 15 to 20 different languages. You know what happens when I need to program in a new language? Google, a couple of books. <laughs> Stack Overflow. Uh, the, uh, when I was hiring engineers for pages, we were doing it in Objective-C, which was a new and obscure language at that point. Really, the only place anyone was using it was on the, uh, uh, the next. And there was only one programmer out of all the ones I hired that had any prior experience with Objective-C. That actually included me. I didn't have any as an what I was looking for were, were great software engineers with domain experience, with proven track records, and who seemed to fit in well, which is why we had the, what I described in our interview process is we bring someone in and basically that person, it's, I think the CEO would talk to her him as well, but all of us, meaning all the existing engineers, would interview the person. And then we'd have to be unanimous. Any one engineer had a veto. And if we all agreed, yes, this is the person we're going to hire, we'd hire this person. It was a slow process, but it actually was a great interview process. What have been your biggest frustrations in the <laughs> this had to you, in the interview process you've gone through so far? Yes. Um, so I did it and I had to do the coding on the website while we were on the phone call. So I just 
did one last week where it was like, oh, compare these two strings and see if they're anagrams. So it did it took me 15 minutes to do it using Jeff like telling me things that should change and think of differently and have to go back and do my own magic framework. And then he said, do this math problem in like 10 seconds. And an hour later, I'll be able to pass it off for other people. So I was like, I hate my life. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it's, I have a library. I have a big library. I have about three or four bookshelves filled with technical books. Uh, I am not, I consider myself moderately bright. I, I, I've known lots of software engineers who, frankly, are far more talented than me, far more brilliant. But what I am is a bulldog. You give me a problem time to do research, and I'll sink my teeth into it. And I will analyze it to death, and I will search it out, and I will write work with code. Uh, that doesn't come across in a, in a 30 minute interview, uh, particularly with the language you have to use before. It's like, why are you testing people under memory of a given language? Yeah. Um, one as far as the interview I don't like is like, tell me about what you're reading. I'm like, you want me to just make some crap up? <laughs> make one that sounds like a strength? Is that supposed to be the right answer? Like, I almost want to take the next one and say, would you rather me just demonstrate knowledge? <laughs> yeah, and I knew it. I'd be working on it. Yep. Oh, that's that, that's actually yes. That is a compliment. And, and the, you know what I like better than the, because I did a lot of interview. I, I don't like the. Tell me your weakness. But one of the questions I always like asking is, tell me about your experience with someone who is really difficult to work with and how you handle it. That to me is a vastly more interesting question because it's kind of like, oh well, yeah, there was this one guy and you know he was he really didn't know what he's doing and I had to do this because that tells me how well they're gonna fit in. You had your hand up. For me, the second one up there, with asking to write code on the spot, no access to the internet. Though the slightly worse one that bugs me is when they ask you to write code out instead of using a debugger uh -huh. or IDE, and they're like, we expect you to get working code. I'm like, I am not going to get working code without being able to debug it. Like, I've never wrote on perfect code the first time. Yep. Yep. Um, can you give us like a best case um, like answer? Just like if I ask you that question, if I'm in an interview with you and I ask you that, like, what are you, can you like just tell me? Give me well, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you an example. I had a, a job where there was a programmer who was very brilliant, uh, had great insight, made some significant contributions, and then became increasingly distracted by some personal problems in his life. And the way that showed up was he became increasingly critical. <coughs> Uh, of the rest of his team members, he was disdainful of us. Uh, kept saying this product's never going to ship, we're never going to get this done. And what I did is I basically worked with him as best as I could in terms of where I had to, and then I left the rest of the VP of engineering, who eventually fired me. That's sort of. Sort of the example there. Uh, so there, there, that's that's probably the example I would brought up. Okay. Anyone have else have horror stories about interviews that you'd like to share here? Yes. Well, I'm not really too sure of the point, but I interviewed for like a on campus job a few years back as a programming job, and I guess there I did a hiring was for chunks of the language that was like 20 years in the past. I barely got updated. They said they choose it because they know no one. And they wanted to you to sit there and explain as best you can what the code is doing. And that was the interview. That's that's a bizarre interview. <laughs> 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 yeah, sort of. Yes. It could be because all the campus systems aren't such old code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's yeah, the yeah. stuff in PL1. Tell us what this PL1 code is doing because we don't know. <laughs>
Yeah. Playing well with others. Uh, you want different viewpoints. You want different experiences. We had uh, cages, we had people with master's degrees. We had one programmer who only had a GED. We came from different domains. Uh, and actually, there, there, like, as I mentioned, we, we did have some uh, real conflict in the early days because we were under a lot of pressure. We were trying to raise money, and there were some serious disagreements. And frankly, I was doing a poor job being both the team leader and the chief architect. Uh, we managed to get that sorted out. But what you don't want is a monitor. You want people who can bring different perspectives to problems, and you want to listen to what those perspectives are. You want people who have different, if possible, well, there's sort of a trade-off here. You know, if I'm going to do a word processor, yeah, I, one of the things that I was hiring were people who had at least some background in word processing. As it turned out, only a few of the programmers we hired did, and one of the ones I hired who did have some background was one I fired after a month because he really wasn't <laughs> was producing it. Uh, the, uh, but this is why we had the all the inter engineers interview every candidate. Because we wanted to make sure everyone was going to get along with each other. Even with that, we had conflicts. We have Adding, adding a new person to the team, and again, this is something that as you get so wrong, it's not like, oh yeah, we're going to add three new people so we can get stuff done. And they don't recognize what they've just created, both in terms of your class and physical bandwidth issue. It's like, okay, you know, they're all just added new communication links within the team, and you just slowed down the people who are already working because they have to bring new people up to speed. And oh, by the way, we now have to see how these these uh, personalities mesh with each other. Uh, particularly if you're talking about product development, especially in a small startup, you learn to adapt to and around each other's quirks. Uh, each time you bring someone new into that mix, it reshuffles all the relationships. So you need to think carefully about why you're adding new people uh, and what you expect the outcome of adding new people to be, as opposed to simply increasing a headcount to keep up the management. Any thoughts on this? Anything you guys have seen? Probably haven't experienced this quite the same. Question. Yes? Um, so this isn't what you said about the whole point of growing team size and the sake of growth. A lot of companies I've interviewed have told me that they will hire me if they want me, like if I'm a good fit. Um, but they're not trying to like meet or like Facebook. Facebook just hire people if they're good. Um, and they seem to do well. Um, does this real not hold true for companies that are doing well on Facebook or Walgreens? Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of companies who will simply say, Heck, who is, who is it? I'm trying to think of the company. I don't know if this is something I ever heard or heard at uh, uh, Silicon Slopes, or if it was one of my local tech contacts. The company said, yeah, well, our plans are to hire 100 new programs. But, oh my gosh, what do you do with 100 new programs? Uh, that's a lot of programmers. Uh, if your goal is to hire 100 new programmers, I'm, I'm wondering how many projects you have, how you plan to distribute them, how they're going to integrate within your company. Uh, I'd much rather hear something like, yeah, we're looking for good people. And if you find a good person, it's like, I'm going to hire this person because they're great. And we'll find something for them to do. Well, we'll you know, leverage off an existing team or we'll develop a new side product, whatever you want to find the great ones and hold on to them and you, know, you sort of want to be the taste of the hill. Yeah, 
You know, this guy runs 4 4 and he outpresses all of our linemen. We're going to find something for him to do. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, that's, a, that's, that's a good approach for companies to take, is to hire if they think they're really happy. Apparently, with Facebook, though, you don't want to be the ones filtering content. I don't know, I don't know how many of you read that story that came out. They have, they have, they have a contract for Phoenix, in Phoenix that filters Facebook content. These people are apparently depressed and on drugs, literally, for all the stuff that they're looking at and having to filter out uh, that gets posted. Anyway. Okay. This You know, DeMarco and Lister have a tendency to sort of mash a bunch of stuff up in single chapters. Uh, part, of, part of the issue, we've already talked about flow in here. Uh, too often organizations don't recognize the need to lead developers alone. They will have, and we're going to talk more about meetings as we go through the market lister. They'll have lots of meetings. Uh, you'll be getting emails from your manager. You'll be getting emails from HR. You'll be getting emails from random people. You'll have other developers come by your desk and start talking to you when you're trying to program, uh, especially if you're in an open office environment. Uh, people chewing gum loudly. Uh, or eating food six feet away from you. Companies don't recognize that the best thing you can do with software engineers is reduce distractions. Give them the opportunity to get into the flow and to stay there. Now, we Software engineers have to be careful that we don't set ourselves up to fail this way. If you're going to program, turn off notifications on your smartphone. Or turn off your smartphone. You know, disable Slack on your computer unless you really, really need to have it on. You have to have the discipline to allow yourself to get on the flow. <coughs> Whatever environment that's presented to you. Anyone have experiences with distracting workplaces that you'd like to talk about? Okay. Yes. So, uh, where I work, we are also where the CSRs from the mechanical engineering department work. So, oftentimes when I'm in the middle of trying to solve some problem for the website that I work on, uh, if the CSRs aren't there, or even if they are there, somebody oftentimes walks in looking for tech support for something that I don't know how to do, and they say, hey, I need to install, but could he allow on my picture because IP addresses at work can like, I'm sorry, I'm a web developer, I can't help you. So then they waste they waste my time and then I waste their time. And then by the time it's all over, both of us are dissatisfied. I have to get back into the flow and they don't have to come and solve it. Yep. Yep, that's actually a great, great example. Anyone else? Uh, come on, we'll, we'll late in the day. People like don't raise our hands when we oversee our it is true. Don't raise your hands in the dark sooner. Uh, <laughs> how do you keep people happy? Those of you who have had happy experiences working, what made it a happy place to work at or happy work? Yes. So, uh, at my internship, they had, I forgot what we called it, like fitness clubs for an hour. An hour of your work week you can count as paid time. You can go out and do some activity. So I was part of the rock climbing club. And I love rock climbing. So it was really cool to go with like members of my team out for an hour and we'd get lunch together and then go climb for an hour, come back, and I knew I was still getting paid for it. So there you go. That's great. That makes it happen. Others, yes. Uh, my experience um, 
my boss basically says you have these issues where you have this many screw points to uh, get done this week, and you have whatever resources you want. You can use your time however you want to to get it done. You want to take three hours to Google or React and watch videos, you do that. If you want to whiteboard with me or any brokers, do that. Um, if you want to leave this time, come out or leave the office this time, come in this time, whatever you want to, just do it. As long as you get your stuff done, you don't care how you do it. And like, I'm really happy with that one. I, yes. Uh, I, I listen to this TED talk and it's something I've seen a lot. It's just that like the best workplace environments, especially for like technical jobs, it's just a place where you get to like you have autonomy and you get to like work on cool stuff and where you have a chance to be a part of something bigger, I guess. So like I think it's just important to like I guess to make sure people are like happy with what they're doing, the decisions they get to make, and that they actually feel like what they're doing matters and that it's not just like useless to what the company is trying to achieve. Yep. And actually this gets back to the article you read on aligning uh, personal goals. Uh, basically the, the whole exercise we did, which I said I've, I've seen other people write up write up the same concept, which is to find out why the programmers are there and once you know what everyone's you know, personal goals, personal slash professional goals all for even being there. Saying, okay, as a team, this is how we're going to support everyone's goals, and then how does this align with the company itself? Yeah. I, mean, I was going to say, like, as a TA, well, like, one of our professors that I worked for said that the stuff we do as a TA shouldn't cause us to sacrifice our success at school. Like, I just knew, like, when he said that, he respects us as people and the students. Like, yeah. he's just sees their slogans. Like, he knows that we have lives and that we may need to I'm pretty sure I've already told the story at Pages. We had uh, a group of four engineers who would take two-hour lunches. Uh, they'd, they'd go off and usually leave by 11 and come back about 1. And I had, after a while, I had the CFO come to me and sort of complain. You know, we have these guys who are going off taking four-hour lunches. And I said, John, they're working 60 hours a week. They're getting the work done. I don't care how long they're not lunch. <laughs> I said, if it keeps them happy, it keeps them here. We're back to the fact of what is the uh, cost of having just one developer on a team lead? The data, the, the knowledge, the lack of ignorance, the hard won knowledge that she or he walks out with. Uh, and this is the argument I, I would have all the time with both our CEO and CFO of Pages. It's like, no guys, we need to do this to keep the developers happy because if we lose just one of these engineers, it's going to set us back tremendously. And, and to Larry and John's credit, they listen to me. Uh, probably the most important thing to keep in mind there is the surveys that have found the number one reason why people leave jobs is their meeting. That will drive that will drive people away. A bad immediate manager will drive them away. And contrarywise, a outstanding immediate manager. I I know the situation, which I won't talk about in case people who know the situation know who I'm referring to. But I know someone who would leave their current job in a heartbeat if it were not for the outstanding manager that this person works with. This person absolutely loves this manager. Manager has been a champion, has gone back, has done things to this particular programmer. Uh, and the programmer has made it very clear that they would be long gone if we're not for that. Now, in all this, with unhappiness, uh, I will say this. Keep in mind, you are trying to support yourself, and sometimes your family. My wife and I raised a lot of kids, and as we became adults, the standard advice I gave them in terms of employment was never quit your current job until you had a new job lined up. I give that advice to all of you. <laughs> if you find yourself in an unhappy job, do not quit that unhappy job until you have a new job lined up. You know, just grit your teeth, bear with it, do that. Because there is an instinctive and often unconscious bias against hiring unemployed people. Particularly the tech market, it's kind of like you're an unemployed, you don't have a job. 
You know, unless, unless you know, you're like the number three contributor to Slack, to Slack uh, or Stack Overflow. They say, who are you? You're, you're, no one's picked you up. This is a high demand market. Why aren't you working? So, three pieces of advice, sir. Uh, <clears throat> human capital. Again, particularly in software engineering, people, generally speaking, not interchangeable, unless the first person you're replacing is, is just incompetent. In which case, you may be simply better off to, you know, Rook says adding people to a late project will make it later. There have been some situations where I have recommended or I've seen the organization simply say the project is late, we're removing people from it. You know what? It helps the project. <laughs> it really does. Because people who remain get very focused on what they have to, not, not out of risk of being laid off, but uh, you know, they, they suddenly can't sort of mentally think, oh, so-and-so is working, that so-and-so is working, and it's like, oh my gosh, we, we're down to you know, four people. So we've got to figure out how to get this done and divide up the work and make sure we're, we're tightly coordinated. Uh, that said, you don't want that knowledge walking out the door. You don't want a situation where if you lose a particular engineer, your project is going to crash and burn. Yeah? How many programmers should you have on a particular project? Only as many as it takes, or maybe as many as it takes minus one. Uh, the, it, it depends entirely on the project. Uh, this is there's one reason why architecture is good up front. Conway's law. You build, you build. What you, the system you build to reflect the communications and structural organization of your team. So what you really want is one in your architecture up front so you can know who you need to hire and who talks to them. Yeah. I guess this question is about the last thing we talked about. But if you're at a job and you want a new job, how sneaky do you have to be applying for those places where you're still working? Is that something you want to be really sneaky about? Or is that cool? Or? Oh, it's very cool to be sneaky. You don't have to tell them. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I've done it both ways. I've, I've had uh, my first job out of college was General Dynamics. I actually liked the job a lot, but my, my former wife back then. Former wife and I, it was too expensive to buy a house in San Diego, so we, we, I went to my boss there and said, look, you know, I'm really happy here, but we can't afford a house in San Diego. We're looking at other parts of the country. Uh, and he, Tom Reed, bless his heart, said, let me see if I can find something in one of our other divisions. Uh, and have you, have you moved there? And I actually flew out to Massachusetts to interview for a position, except when I got out there, the person I went to said, well, actually, we don't have that position open anymore. We have a free trip to Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. uh, the, uh, uh, in other situations, now you, you, you don't necessarily want to. Would you get in trouble if they found out? No, oh, well, would, would they let you go? Some companies would, some companies would. Here's what you want to avoid, and this is one of the hardest, hardest things. What you want to avoid, which you never really want to do, is accept a position at another job, company, and then have your first company talk you out of it and go back and stay with them. Because they'll never trust you again. Uh, they'll think, well, maybe he did this just to raise his salary. I, I speak from personal experience. It's not a good way to raise your salary. Though. Well, it's, <laughs> it's a bad way to raise your salary. Now, a good way to raise your salary, uh, thinking thinking of uh, my daughter, uh, was that she she became aware that you know, with, with two or three years under her belt and a great track record in her company, New hires were coming in for 10k a year more than she was making, and then she went to her manager and said, "New hires are getting hired at 10k more than I'm making, and I, frankly, am contributing far more to this, this country." And country. <laughs> 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 the country paying higher taxes, you know. Uh, and her manager, plus plus her manager's heart, said, "You're right. 
and went to bat and got her very substantial raise. Uh, if, if, you're, if, if that's an issue, you raise that as an issue before, before that. Uh, likewise, if you're unhappy, you say, you know, look, I'm not, I'm not really happy here. I'm looking for this kind of contribution. Is there anything you can do for me? And if they say sure and they move on it, that's fine. If they say no, then you start interviewing for jobs. Uh, that's what I did. It's actually what I have done <laughs> several times. Anyway, I changed jobs four times, like first four years out of college. Not recommending that. As well. <laughs> but I did lose my salary substantially for four years. Other other hands up? Anyone, anyone? Yes. I don't remember where was, but somebody was talking about how people want to get promotions. Yeah. Oh, uh, actually, that's you say without becoming a manager. Yes, yeah, not a great deal. This is the problem. This is this is a problem I have been talking about and consulting with companies about, writing about for years. Far too many companies fail to have a technical track above senior developer. Like it's kind of like entry level developer, senior developer, and then CTO. That's it. <laughs> So you've got all your seniors getting, you may, you may have 50 senior developers and one CTO. It's like there's nothing in between. Uh, and I have strenuously argued that companies who want to hold on to their top talent need some form of actual uh, technical track. Because a lot of us don't want to become managers. You know, I, 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 I have managed people, I've managed consultants and so on and so forth, but I, I really, a job in management is not what I'm good at. Uh, it is my technical jobs that I, you know, <coughs> I have skills at. Now, some organizations do it by, in essence, having a title-wise, a flat structure. Member of technical <coughs> staff. Well, organizations, all their technical people, you're a member of technical staff, and you individually get raises uh, and benefits and so on to reflect your skills or contributions without necessarily any kind of title change. Uh, but that's, that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a very good question when you're interviewing. Say, what's the technical track here? What can I aspire to? What you'll find is in parts of many companies, it's, you know, entry, regular developer, senior developer, and then everyone, you know, fighting to become the CTO. Probably ends up getting hired from the outside anyway. Or is the founder's cousin or something? Uh, <clears throat> so you don't want to be the CIO. CIO is not a good job. CIOs get fired all the time. <laughs> don't want to be a CIO. What's the CIO? Chief Information Officer. CIO is usually a business person who has a little bit of technical background. Sometimes it's a technical person who has some, you know, has an MBA. But the CIO always gets sucked into the dark side of uh, business processes and management and fails to remember how to actually get projects live. Uh, there's a high rate of turnover in those CIOs in most organizations because they're only as good as their last failed project. Okay. <laughs> Keep an IT, strong IT staff. Uh, uh, you're all getting tired. Go read the article. <laughs> There'll be a link to it in the slides when I post the slides. Okay, we have one more lecture, so don't, don't back up yet. Uh, I just happened to stick this on the end of this presentation. By Saturday, your test plan documentation, which is what we're about to talk about. Revise other deliverables as needed. Another status report, another podcast. Read the rest of Peopleware. Last half of the book is, is it's, a, it's a fast read and they sort of go all over the place. That's why someone asked me, why is it all lumped into one lecture? It's like, oh, that's about what you need. And then Webster 6, and I don't remember what Webster 6 is. So let me get to the, the next and last lecture here. Let's talk about creating test plans. Now, much. Oh, hang on a second.